So let's review to begin with today. First with the question, you answer it, what is eternal life? There's actually a couple of right answers we could put in here, but what is eternal life? Ding, here's, here's the answer now. <laughs> Number one, it is God's kind of life. Now, the Bible doesn't actually say it's God's kind of life, but it does tell us that God had life in himself, and that's what he's shared or imparted to us. So we'd say it's God's kind of life. Number two, it is, John 17, 3, eternal life is us experientially knowing the Father and the Son. Well, we're using their life, and when we use it like they would use it, like they have used it, like they do use it, we're actually getting to know them on an experiential level. Not just where we pick up a book on theology and read about this, and or even just read our Bibles and just go, well, God says this about himself and this about himself. And those things control how we interpret our experience. What we read in the Bible helps us interpret our experience and say it's limited to this. It's these kind of things. But it's still an experience, personally getting to know God the Father and the Son. This is what eternal life is. Now, many people, in fact, I, I asked this, this question in a Bible study last night with uh, some of uh, uh, my friends here, and I said, how would most people define eternal life? And I, I think everybody or most people that replied said, you live forever or something to that effect. That that's what people think eternal life is. We just live forever. In other words, we look at eternal in terms of time. Scripture really looks at eternal in terms of its timelessness. The fact that it is related to the God who is Timeless, the God who is the I am, the God who always exists, no beginning, no end. And that quality of life, then he shares with us. Now, our experience is limited from the point we begin out into the future. Or maybe from your perspective, it would be this way, into the future. But it, it isn't, it, it isn't some, a, a life that we experience for just a brief moment. But we haven't always experienced it because unlike God, we did have a beginning. We had parents. And those parents go back to a set of parents in eternity, or not in eternity, but way back in the past, Adam and Eve, who were created. They had a beginning. We had a beginning. But God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit didn't never had a beginning. So all this is review on eternal life. Now, when we're talking about this experience about eternal life, we're going to ask, try to answer this question today. Is there any way that we can say, well, we actually know this. We objectively, objectively know that we have this life. And we are going to look at that today. Most of you would probably say, and this would be my first answer before we looked at this text, would be, well, if I've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, well, then I know that I have eternal life because he told me that's his promise, that I have it now. But John's going to give us another way that we can have an objective knowledge that we have eternal life. Pastor Tim Holscher, we're working verse by verse through 1 John. We're in chapter 3, and um, I want to jump back up for just a moment. We were looking at the fact that we, he says, you know that you have heard, this is back in verse 11, you've heard the message from a beginning, that is the beginning of Christian truth, there's no definite article, that we should love one another, and not love like Cain. Now, he talked above about people that don't love their brothers. Well, Cain, he says, don't love like Cain did. Now, the implication is Cain had a kind of a love for his brother, but it was a kind of love that allowed him to slay his brother. He doesn't say he didn't love him. He says, love one another, not like Cain did, not even as Cain did. Now, he could just be saying, don't do what Cain did, but I think it's also easy to, say, to look at this and say, see, there is a love between people in the world. But it's the kind of love that, in the right circumstances, will let a person do this. And might Christians do something like this? Yes, but it's not going to be a demonstration of divine love, love that is connected to the eternal life. Any king killed his brother. You may take a, have a different take on the way I understand that, but I, I think that there was in there some sort of probably a familial love, but it wasn't enough to keep him from treating his brother well. So verse 13, so he says, do not be surprised then, brethren, if the world hates 
you. Now, this kind of seems like an odd thing to say after he just got done talking about uh, Cain and Abel and what he's doing here, or what happened there and the kind of love that we should have. But, I, and I think that this is immensely important for us to get, believers that are looking for friendship and companionship and acceptance in the world can find friendship, companionship, acceptance in the world as long as they do exactly what the world wants, but what the world wants and what they find is always tenuous. It doesn't take much for those relationships built on the things of the world system to totally unravel and sometimes unravel with frightening speed. And I hope that that hasn't been your experience, but my, uh, my interaction with other believers is I've watched a lot of relationships that believers have with other believers, and just put it that way, no matter how they're how they might have any other connections, then watch those those relationships just unravel just crazy fast. And uh, that's what's going to happen if you become entangled with the world. So he says, don't be surprised that the world hates you. And and this is the point. The world is not where you're going to find love. The world is not where you're going to find the connection that God intends you to find. The the intention what God intends for you to find is going to go back up with what we looked up here in verse 11, that we should love one another, or as we come to verse 14, that we should love one another. Verse 14 says, we know, and this word is not our word for experiential knowledge now, now we have our word oida. We have come to know with the result that it remains an, an objective fact, objectively we know, that we have, and again he uses a perfect tense, we have passed or transferred out of the realm of death. And it's not just death in general, but it's the death, talking about spiritual death. As Paul says in the middle of Ephesians 4, being cut off or separated from the life of God. That's over. We are never again going to be separated from the life of God. So he says, we then, we then objectively know that we have transferred and remain transferred out of the death, out of spiritual death, into the life. Now, what life is he talking about? Again, this eternal life. Because we love the brothers. In other words, he says, we can objectively look at this love and objectively, based on this fact, based on what he's saying here, we can objectively know that we are no longer in the realm of death. We're now in the realm of life. Now, you'd say, well, why isn't this experience knowledge? Why is it he looking at it objective knowledge? I believe he does this here in this context because he's saying, when you love like this, you might go, this is not my kind of love. This is incredible because I know how selfish I can tend to be. If we're objective, we'd go, yeah, I tend to struggle with my love being selfish in the way I deal with people. But he says, you are able to objectively look at that love and say, you know what that love tells me? That love tells me that I'm not spiritually dead anymore. I am. I now move in the realm of life. And you'd say, well, that sounds like experience. But the thing is, when you love, it's not like a, a light goes on and you go, ding, ding, ding. This is, this is eternal life. This is eternal life. You're not spiritually dead anymore. Now, is there an experience kind of going on? Yes. But he's laying emphasis on the fact that sometimes you have to go back to objective truth that is that God tells us, and you need to go back and rest in that objective truth when when this is going on and say, I'm, this is love. This is God's kind of love. And I'm no longer spiritually dead. I now move in the realm of spiritual life. However, he says, he who does not love, the one who doesn't love, it's just, it's his way of life. Again, using a present tense here, as he's been doing. The one that is not loving, that one abides, or he's comfortable. He's at ease in the sphere of spiritual death. Now, that could be maybe a believer. I know that there's some ways that that could be handled that way, but I think it's just plain and simple. Again, he's drawn a contrast between you people, you, especially you young believers. Look at the difference you're no longer in the realm of death. You're now in the realm of life. Those antichrists that left, don't, don't, don't feel broken up that they're not here with you anymore. Because guess what? They're still comfortable moving in the realm of death. 
they don't have this because they never had this love as he developed back in the context. You have something they do not have. And you have life, which is also something they do not have. If you didn't fill that in, the details, you have love, they don't. You have eternal life, they don't. And this is what he's getting at. You have passed out of the realm of death into life. Now, just to be clear, I want to go over to John chapter 5, and Jesus here is uh, speaking with a group of religious leaders after he's healed a man on the Sabbath. And he says, Truly, truly, I say to you that the one who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And then he uses the this, this same Greek phrase that John's using over there in 1 John chapter 3. And he does not come into judgment, but as passed out of death into life. See, we have eternal life. We've passed out of the realm of the spiritual death into the realm of the life. What life? The eternal life again. One other detail here that's beautiful. You don't come into judgment. God might discipline you according to Scripture, but you and I as believers, we do not come into judgment. You realize how much, if we wrap our heads around this, how much grief this saves us as believers? And if somebody says, well, if you don't preach judgment and you don't do that to keep people in line, well, then they're going to just do whatever they want. Back in my day, people would say, well, they're just going to smoke all they want and drink all they want and party all they want because, you know, those are all the things you were trying to always stop people from doing. And are there believers that occasionally run them a little bit amok? Yeah. But you know what most of the time I find to be true? That when believers realize, realize that we are free from death, that we have life, and that we are no longer judged, as Paul says in Romans 8, 1, we're not condemned. You know what really happens? Usually those believers, it changes the way they live. They begin to live differently. They live in light of the fact that they have this absolutely certain, sure salvation. Teaching people and trying to scare them into being better and I'm talking about Christians. I'm not talking about unsaved people. We're talking about trying to scare believers into, the, into being better by making them afraid of judgment. You know what? A lot of times that doesn't work well. Then they begin, and I've watched this happen and I've done it myself, they begin to try to live the outward expression of the Christian life, the things that they've kind of learned that this looks like this and this, and they try to mimic that by the efforts of their own flesh. And it's hollow. It's not fulfilling. It leaves you miserable. Yeah, it does leave you miserable. Because you're going, this isn't the way it should be. And that's right, it shouldn't be that way. We have such a much better experience in a relationship that we have with God, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. We have passed out of death and we've passed into life. We have eternal life here and we have, shall we say, resurrection life because we've been raised up with Jesus Christ in the heavenlies at the same time that down here he indwells us and shares with us God's kind of life. And it makes it possible for us to, oh, we're, we're not in the right verse, pardon me, because we are able to have experience, this experience of love with other believers and we can objectively know this truth. Hope that encourages you, Dave. Man, this, every time I go through these verses, it just reinvigorates me, re encourages me all over again in terms of what God's doing that I might really live a Christian life that is different. As always, I really encourage you, truly, remember who you are in Christ so that you might have a good day in the Lord, Jesus Christ. And thank you for joining me.